Socio-Economic Rights and Accountability Project, CERAP, has filed a lawsuit against the Senate President, Goswil Akwabio, and the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Tajuddin Abbas, over the failure to disclose, clarify, and explain the details of the National Assembly budget of $344.85 billion naira and the rationale for several budget items, such as the six billion naira budgeted for two car parks. Serap is seeking, quote, an order of mandamus to direct and compel Mr. Akwabio and Mr. Abbas to disclose, clarify, and explain the details of the 8.5 billion naira budgeted for, quote, National Assembly liabilities in the Appropriation Act 2024 and the nature of any such liabilities and how and why they have been incurred, unquote. According to Sarah, quote, opacity in the spending of the 344.85 billion National Assembly budget would have negative impacts on the fundamental interests of the citizens and public interest, unquote. Joining us, is joining us for this discussion is the Deputy Director of Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project, Sarah Kolawale Oluwadare, and also joining us is the Executive Director Center for Fiscal Transparency and Integrity Watch. Center for Fiscal Transparency and Integrity Watch, CEFTIW, Omar Yakubu. Omar Yakubu, Welcome to Plus Politics. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Omar. Yes, sir. How would you want to summarily enlighten our viewers about whatever may be the grounds that you have with some of these peculiar issues uh, specified by Sarah? Okay, thank you for inviting me. Uh, first of all, I think Sarah is in the what is doing is in the right direction because if you check the meaning of um, what it takes to be honourable or what it takes to be distinguished, uh, which we call our members, honourable members and distinguished members, is based upon dignity, honour, and doing the right thing without even being pushed to do the right thing. Now, in normal societies or in Greek societies in the of the old. Not everybody is given that designation that you are an honorable person or you are a distinguished person. So what Sarap is doing is, is asking the National Assembly just to be honorable and to be distinguished persons by disclosing. Honestly, actually uh, disp uh, proactively disclosing this information without even having to invoke the Freedom of Information Act or having the need to even take the matter to court to tell them to disclose their expense, expenses on public expenditure. So this is my view that setup is doing the right thing and every honorable person, whether as a body, as a national assembly, as a body or in or individuals has the duty to proactively disclose information on public expenditure, especially now that we're in a terrible economic situation where we need to manage funds effectively and use them efficiently for national development. Thank you. Omar. Yes, sir. As wonderful as your presentation is, and I can't agree any less than, you know, with you, but mm. I'm sitting there thinking that we have a fundamental problem, and I see some of the people in our society who should help us to to correct that fundamental problem, engaging with the engaging with the melodrama that the members of the National Assembly fundamentally want you people, you know, uh, want you people to engage on. We have a budgeting culture that speaks to opacity, to to we have a budgeting culture that speaks to quote-unquote, uh, 
loading the budget, you just have a line or two that says the car park is going to be rehabilitated or the, the car park is going to be, two car parks to be done. No architectural drawings, no uh, quantity, no bill of quantities uh, submitted. We have a budgeting culture that says, you know, we have 8 billion naira indebtedness and we want to, we want to clear it. Is it not the budgeting culture that we should be fundamentally tackling? Why is we don't also remove our eyes from some of these iniquities that, you've, that you, have, you, know, you are lasering on? How would you respond to that remark? Okay, first you have to look at uh, the, the, our, the political fathers that developed our constitution. I have to believe that when they were developing it, they did the three arms of government, where you have the executive, you have the legislature, and you have the judiciary. But maybe, maybe having that thing in mind, they didn't frame a framework where you can check the National Assembly, which is the legislature, and the judiciary, which is why you see most more focus is on the legislature to check the executive. That is, any time you see a legislator will tell you that is their primary responsibility. Now, who checks the legislature? Who checks the judiciary? That's why I give you that premise that probably the framers of the constitution were thinking that the people occupying those positions have for hundreds of years been honorable and distinguished people. That is why you don't really see any framework around the checking of the excesses and over budgetary expenditure we see in the newspaper every day. Now, when you wake up one morning and decide to say you're spending 3 billion, 5 billion, 8 billion, whatever the amount is for just a budget, Apart from civil society and the media, what Plus TV is doing right now, it doesn't come out. It doesn't come out. Nobody knows what's happening. So we need to establish a framework somewhere that apart from the media and civil society, that somebody is checking the excesses of the legislature and the judiciary. Now, within the executive, because it's public expenditure, they are bound by rules of transparency. Under the Procurement Act, every government expenditure is subjected to the Public Procurement Act. Now, and some of the principles of that Procurement Act entails transparency, proactive disclosure. There is no need for setup to even have to take them to court. Proactive disclosure of what the details of that car park or whatever, or if of the total three hundred and thirty-four billion. Now, not only that small component of that entire budget, anything that has to do with procurement should be subjected to the principles of the Public Procurement Act. That is one. Now, we have other rules regarding fiscal transparency and transparency measures. You know, in Nigeria, there are so many. You know, even under the Finance Act, you, you are supposed to disclose all this kind of information. Now, we do see them, probably because the, the people that are supposed to check, which are the National Assembly members, the National Assembly are not even effectively checking the executives. So maybe they don't have the capacity to check themselves. That could be a gap. Maybe they don't have the capacity to know how to check themselves. But let's not forget that we have the National Assembly Service Commission that could actually even play a role there. Now, how effective have they been in monitoring the activities of the National Assembly? So it's a complex problem that we need to just improve our level of transparency. Okay. Now, even before that, yes, sir. I, I think it's about time we made our viewers realize that the National Assembly is, is a bicameral legislature and because it's a bicameral legislature in the two chambers of the National Assembly, we have representatives of Nigerians from different political parties. And that is why the chairperson of the public accounts committee is always from the opposition and the chairperson of the appropriation committee is from the party with the majority number of members in the two chambers. There's a one. So I wonder, that is why sometimes I laugh when people are saying Labour Party, PDP, APC. Essentially, like you rightly pointed out, they tend to have a tendency to connive and agree on some of the things that will benefit them 
against Nigerians irrespective of their partisan disposition. That is number one. Number two is that, Umar, we must also let our viewers know that unfortunately, unfortunately, the members of National Assembly have so made it difficult for that constitutional provision to be activated, but the members of the National Assembly and the State's House of Assembly can be subjected to a process of recall about time that you, as a civil society organization leader, and myself, as a journalist, about time that we sensitized and, uh, and enlighten our, our citizens to know that once these people, because they, they, they essentially feel that when they get into the National Assembly, they can do as they like, or the State House of Assembly. Nobody can yeah. call them to order. But maybe we should be letting their constituents know that if you so feel aggrieved by the conduct of these quote unquote honorable and distinguished members, you can actually orchestrate a mechanism to recall them. I think maybe somebody like me is failing. I can't blame somebody like you because your area of focus is actually finance. But when somebody like you brings out issues like this, maybe somebody like me should be appealing on the fact for our, for our fellow citizens that you can recall these people for some of this some of this arrogance that they put into governance just my take i don't know your response yeah yeah you're actually right but you have to look at and um, deeper look deeper into the issues if you analyze our political process you'll find that it's actually difficult to recall and if you look at from 1999 to date I doubt if more than one or two people have been recalled, even when there were attempts to recall them for political reasons, not for governance reasons, you find out it has failed. Now, most of the time you find out, even though the members of the opposition are the ones that are appointed to head the Public Accounts Committee, there's something that is called harmonization of interests. And most of the time the interest is access to public funds. And once you have those access, you find out there's no rank or other interests have aligned. Now, the principles behind having different parties is they think they'll check up, balance themselves. But that's not happening. They somehow manage to have same interests and converge and agree on such issues like if you have how many honorable members, I don't know whether one or two have decided to say, okay, we must proactively disclose matters related to public expenditure. I'm not aware, and I'm not sure whether you're aware that out of the 360, maybe one or two decided to be honorable. That is one. Two, you have to look at our political culture and political process. Unfortunately, the system is designed in a way that for you to get into political office, they expend a lot of political resources. So which is why most of the time, the first thing they think about is how to recoup those resources. And that's why you find that there's a lot of uh, uh you know craving for the what they call the juicy positions you know there, there's a that's why they take a lot of time before they even appoint who has certain committees so there are several problems and lastly if you look at the process before you even get the party nomination how much people spend money not to talk of the major elections so i always uh, advocate that the major player to solve this kind of problems is relies on INEC. INEC has to de-emphasize the use of money for people to spend in politics. Our electoral system is too expensive. The political process is too expensive even for the politicians. And that is what breeds this kind of problem. So to nip the bud, you know, to solve this problem, actually for me starts from INEC, where the entry point into politics and exit into politics needs to start from curbing the use of funds which research has shown is mostly from public expenditure, public sources, sorry, that is being used to finance elections. And that is why you continue to have these problems right from 1999 to date. Listening to you, to be honest with you, at some point I was indeed, you know, I, I, I could empathize with the intellectual persona. And the reason I, I was empathizing with the intellectual persona is because uh, in so much as some of the points you've made, uh, especially the one, specifically the one 
uh, referring to INEC upping its games. I, I'm sitting there thinking, is it INEC we should be looking at or we should be demanding a total reform of our electoral system in the direction of the Ways Committee's recommendations? Because INEC is seemingly to me, maybe it's me, seemingly overburdened. And because these politicians know that INEC is organically and operationally important, they run rings around INEC. You know, INEC is expected to check people who want to perpetrate criminality, electoral criminality. INEC will be the one that will, you know, prosecute, not the state. INEC is supposed to hold the political parties to account. As we speak, the party that we even think is the most revolutionary, the most uh, better, this thing, now the treasurer is alleging that the chairman has, you know, has gone bonkers with their funds. So, don't you think we may need to engage the executive and the legislature to give us electoral reforms that will be more predisposed to the recommendations of the Ways Committee? See, um, um, there's a lot of trick that usually plays around. Like from what you have said now, if you call for electoral reforms, let's say of INEC, the first thing they will do is set up committee. You bring uh, uh, the committee will sit down for three to six months. After that, they'll bring a report to now implement, they will not implement it. Those are diversionary. If you look at all regulators in Nigeria, INEC, Central Bank of Nigeria, the Nigeria Austin Petroleum Regulatory Commission, all sector regulators say, regulating the oil and all the areas where we have problems, the oil and gas sector, our elections, our finance sector, our economic sector, look at all the regulations, regulators, if you look at their laws, they have enough laws, enough teeth to bite and implement things that will ensure good governance. What the problem we lack is that force of implementation. That is usually what it's lacking. So you find that we waste a lot of time on legislative reform, legal framework, legal framework, institutional framework, but for the effective implementation of those laws and to measure the impact of what is usually lacking. Now, INEC has the power to regulate, just a simple example. INEC has the power to ensure the collection of the audit reports of all political parties. Why do you need a law to collect the audit report? No, you don't. Now, that has not happened for more than five or six years. INEC, by its own law, is mandated to publish its own audit report every two years. That has not happened for over six or seven years. You don't need a legal framework or any reform to do that. So the basic things of transparency are not happening. They are not doing it. And because really nobody is checking them to enforce them. Now, if ANEC is not doing something right, who is supposed to enforce it? The National Assembly, the civil society, the media. All these things are not happening. And they keep telling, okay, yes, we'll publish it. Mind you, don't even they could even publish it and people will not properly scrutinize it. But they are not even publishing it and this is what sometimes you call impunity what does it take to ensure the publication of the audit reports of political parties there are no more than 30 or 40 of them for how many years so what does it take to publish the audit report of INEC that has spent billions of naira billions of naira that a lot has gone to waste waste in terms of there are a lot of things you can use technology you know, to reduce cost, but they will not do it because probably it doesn't serve the, their interest or the interest of some people that work with them. What can, what can somebody who has the functional knowledge of how these things work and who also has the patriotic passion like you beyond the litigation of Serap, what can you tell somebody like us to help you make sure that we enlighten, educate, inform our citizenry so they can coalesce behind people like you and give you the needed support to at least bring these people, you know, uh, let them know that people are watching them. 
Well, it's, it's a long-term thing. This is a continuous thing we'll continue to do. Um, but the basic thing that people need to understand that without good governance, our hospitals are going to continue failing, whether we like it or not. Without good governance, prices of commodities, you can see them skyrocketing now, will continue to occur. Without good governance, we're not going to have a good educational system. And these three things are the basic things somebody needs in life. You need adequate healthcare. You need, you know, to survive. That's the economics to have disposable income to be able to spend on necessities. And you need to have good education for yourself and your children. These are basic things that they are not there. They are their needs, not wants. Now, the only way to ensure good governance is through our political system. We are operating a democracy and the way we need to vote people. Now, unfortunately, there's a culture that has been built for too long where people actually admire people without asking the right questions about where they got their wealth from. Now, that's a problem because that's what they admire. And who you look up to becomes your teacher. That is why sometimes it will be heartbreaking. You ask a child of eight, nine years old what he wants to be, and he may tell he wants to be a governor, he wants to be a senator, not understanding what the rules of being a senator and House of Rep member means of being a governor, because he has seen by example of what those people are, what they do without understanding the process. So we need to educate citizens more, uh, trying to, uh, let me quote uh, former Vice President Osibajo, on the soft issues. We don't have problems with probably educated people, most people are educated. Most people, you know, if you are looking for educational qualification, you get so many. What we have problems with are the soft issues of honesty, integrity. Let me borrow the other word, being honorable, being distinguished. Nobody needs to tell you to disclose your income without set up having to push you to court. Nobody even needs to activate the Freedom of, of Information Act. People should openly, these are public funds, we pay taxes. So people should proactively disclose all this kind of information. And uh, when these things happen, you are going to have better education, you have better access to health care, and your economic uh, disposable income would increase. And these are the things need, you need, you know, to have a good life and a better society. Dr. Umar Yakubu, Executive Director, Center for Fiscal Transparency and Integrity Watch, CEF. TIW, we surely will be having you on um, some other occasions on this platform. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I am Bola Oba. Have a good evening.